listening to Mystic Moon Cafe with Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. Every week, we will interview guests that are experts in various fields of the supernatural, paranormal, unexplained, and esoteric. So sit back and let us take you on a journey to educate, enlighten, and entertain as we broaden your horizons. Now, here's your hosts, Wendy Schindler and Travis Short. You're listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. The views and opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, the network, or our sponsors. Down in Mississippi by Highway 49 Lived an old blues man From another time And when he played his guitar You could hear a thousand souls cry Underneath the stars of the Delta sky The ghost of Clark's tale Dance on the light of the voodoo moon Of the voodoo moon Voodoo moon Oh, that voodoo moon You can feel the magic When the spirits gather there And in the still of the night When all is calm Just listen to the wind And you can hear his song Cause the ghost of clock still Dance on the light was Voodoo Moon by Anthony Gomez. Um, Anthony Gomez is an a independent blues artist here in Kansas City, and uh, he donated a little music to us, so there we go. 
This is we like we... it when they. Yeah. Yeah, and this is Travis, and we love it when people donate thus. Donate Absolutely, things. yes. It's always better. It's always. But I believe uh, that Anthony Gomez will be at Knucklehead Saloon um, either tomorrow night or Friday night. I, I got a little mixed up on that one, but um, sounds like a pretty good show. I like the name Knucklehead Saloon. Sounds like a place <laughs> I should hang out. <clears throat> it, it's a fun place. It used to be a real scary biker type bar and uh <laughs> it was a brothel wasn't it it was a brothel go ahead june's not on the show but it was probably a brothel well i think it was at least a train station way back when <laughs> um, so it could it could very well have been a brothel as well it could have been it could well have been. If, if anything that june investigates it was a brothel she could go into an ihop or a denny's and i swear <laughs> that a brothel at some point in time it does seem to work that way for her it does it does mm-hmm. You know, she could be well, investigating a cathedral <laughs> in, in the heart of Paris, and it would have been a brothel at some point in time. They were kind of synonymous, weren't they? Way they back were, in actually. the day. They, yeah. they, they way back in the day, especially in Paris. <laughs> I mean, Gay Paris, yes, yes. So, oh, it is another Wednesday. It seems like we were just on the show Sunday, and we were. <laughs> yes, we were. We did a great show with uh, Chad and Alta. Mm-hmm. Still there? Still there? Um, I'm, yeah, my headset and mic are screwing up. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. I've got a short, no pun intended, uh, in the uh, in the cabling. I'm going to have to fix that. I'll so, Why is yes, it yes. Left it in the French Quarter live. I don't understand. What is that? Oh, I'm just I. Uh, I'm sorry. I was I was trying to keep my to open up my tablet so that the song could play or so oh, that okay. it, so that could play and I could keep an eye on chat. And it's showing that it's still a Sunday show, but I think that's a mistake of some kind. Maybe just needs to refresh. Maybe. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I'm just not real sure how to refresh that one. I don't. I don't know how to. Hell, I can't even refresh myself today. <laughs> so, it's, hey, it's just, you I didn't know, have to clean like eight bathrooms and and two kitchens today so do umpteen million loads of laundry that's true i i, I did not, <laughs> and i do feel for you and kill a bunch I, of spiders oh did you kill spiders only a few um oh. it's it's a lake a lake house so it's uh they occasionally get some bugs there were a lot of the gannats too Gnats. The gnats were bad. Yeah. The gnats were real bad in the window wells and stuff. I hate those. Oh, me too. They're just yeah. they're pain. Those windows just get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. <laughs> oh. But we had we we did have a really cool show with Chad and Alta, uh, Orbducted in the French Quarter. We dealt with a lot of things there. There was just so much uh, high strangeness. The term that they used. Uh, Paranormal, supernatural, aliens, UFOs, abductions, a werewolf. I mean, it was like, kind of like watching uh, condensed all of the uh, Night Stalker episodes condensed into one uh, one episode for us. I mean, it was just there was so much. It literally was like a crossroads of, of paranormal activity. Yes, it was. It, Lis- it, listening uh, to them. Very interesting, though. It um, was. You know, from the description, I was afraid it would be a little bit different than that, but it, it turned out really well, I thought. It did. It did. And, and of course, we have a great guest tonight, one of our favorite guests who's returning to talk with us. Um, yes. Yes, we have Bill Bean on with us tonight. And for the first time in a very long time, Bill is actually home for this show. He, he had a deliverance today, but it was just in Gettysburg, so he's actually home. He's not in some other weird part of the country. <laughs> so it's all. Oh, it is always good to have Bill on the show with him. Bill is a personal friend. Bill is a client. Uh, he's a great guest. He's the author of Dark Force and Delivered. Also, Ten Steps to Victory. Uh, he is a spiritual warrior, a deliverance minister. He is a uh, media personality. He has been on countless uh, TV shows, uh, which we will talk about some of those. I'm sure as they many of them are contacting him now for his exorcism case files. Uh, reenacting those for these TV series. It is a pleasure to have Bill Bean back on the show. Bill, welcome. 
Yay. Thank you, guys. It's great to be back on with you. And it seems like it's been a long time, but I don't think it's been that long, but it sure seems like it. It's great to be back. It's also great to be home and able to uh, join you guys from the comfort of my own home and office. <laughs> well, Fantastic. Is, thank you. It, yes, thank you for joining us. I always love it when guests actually reach out to us and say, hey, we'd love to come back on the show. And Bill did that <laughs> last week. He's like, it's been a while. I want to come back on. i got a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm like, okay, can you do it this date? And Bill's like, sure. So we, we get Bill booked up, and he's here. Uh, and Yay. just a, a lot of stuff to go over, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of material, a lot of information. Um, let, let's start with – Real quickly, Bill, you you said you were doing a deliverance today without divulging, you know, confidential information. Tell us about what you were doing and who you were and how you were helping this individual. And first of all, you guys should feel really good about this because usually I turn interviews down. I have so many people that come to me for different things and I say, I'm sorry, I'm busy, I'm traveling. Uh, so for me to actually contact you and say, hey, uh, let's do something, that should tell you what I think of you and then where you stand at. So um, I always enjoy being on with you guys. I really do. And, and as far as the uh, deliverance that took place today, uh, okay, I was contacted um, by this lady uh, several months ago, and I had an over-the-phone session with her, and then I was contacted again. Uh, saying that uh, she is in a very bad way health-wise. And um, now she has leukemia. Uh, She's just been diagnosed with this. And um, so I made time to go to her personally in Gettysburg today. And it was amazing. I'll tell you, God never ceases to amaze me. And again, without going too much into detail, it was very powerful to say the least, very sad as well, because in this work, I don't just go blazing through the door, you know, as this spiritual warrior, and and yes, I am very intense, and I do, uh, with the power of God, you know, Uh, When I start the spiritual warfare aspect, I am absolutely, you know, full steam ahead and uh, the best defense is a strong offense and things of that nature. But before I get to that point, I'm every bit as much of a counselor, and that is, uh, you know, uh, part of being a minister is that, uh, you know, I have to know what is going on and I have to get the person's story. And... A common thread in a lot of these cases, I'm sorry to say, and I have been involved now in hundreds and hundreds of these cases worldwide, and I travel all over America nonstop helping people from all walks of life. And the most common thread in this, I'm sorry to say, in a lot of these cases um, is that some sort of molestation, child molestation, or uh, rape, or some type of violent crime. There has to be something that has brought a great trauma into the life of the the person, the person that's being victimized. There has to be something that opens that door up. Yes, a trigger that opens that door. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, in a lot of the cases, uh, there was some sort of molestation, you know, child molestation that had taken place. And sometimes, unfortunately, you know, as if the act isn't bad enough, it's a wicked, heinous act, and it's as low as a person could go when they do something like that, you know, to a child. I don't think there's anything more vile and disgusting than that. And uh, sometimes, I'm sorry to say, there are priests and pastors that are responsible for some oh, of these no. wicked, heinous crimes. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's heartbreaking, and it stays with the victims um, 
you know, just imagine when a victim has had this type of thing happen um, by a so-called regular person. Uh, that's horrible enough, but when it is perpetrated by someone um, that is a pastor, or priest, or minister, or whatever, you know, that for me, I would think that would have to be twice as bad because that's someone that you would put your trust in and you wouldn't dare think that that someone uh, of that nature in that office uh, would be capable of doing something like that. And so it just shatters a person. It shatters their faith as well because think about it, you know, especially if it's a child that is just beginning to have seeds planted about God and faith and uh, Jesus and how to follow the path. Um, and then, my goodness, you know, something like that happens. Uh, it's just, it's earth shattering. It is, uh, I just can't imagine. So it breaks my heart when someone comes under this type of wicked, heinous crime. And I can't say on the show how I feel and what I would do to someone like that. Uh, it just it breaks my heart. So the doorway opens wide when a person comes under this type of thing. And so that stays with the person for life until someone like me comes along to where God can work through that person to uh, deliver the to deliver the victim, and so I, I want to say this: that I praise God for guiding me there. I praise God for working through me to deliver that woman, and I also believe one hundred percent that God worked through me to take all of that illness and cancer, leukemia, all that out and off and away from her. And I believe it. And I praise God for it. Um, she vomited violently after the deliverance took place. And that happens sometimes. Uh, when a person is carrying that kind of garbage around and there's that level of um, attachment and uh, it, it's not a full possession, but it is a very strong uh, oppression. Mm -hmm. and it stays on that person, and it, what it's designed to do and what the devil does is he assigns demons, you know, to people that are afflicted like this, and the whole agenda is to wear that person down to the point to where the person becomes suicidal. They don't want to live anymore. Um, they begin to live very recklessly and carelessly. Now, I know what I'm talking about because I've been there in my own life in my younger years and lived that way to where I was looking, uh, I was seeking death. And so I understand this uh, 100%, and it just breaks my heart. Um, and this person was getting to the point of really seriously considering suicide. And so, again... Our God is an awesome God. He put it on my heart and spirit, alerting me that this was very, very serious. And usually if somebody contacts me for help, I have to have my assistant, Melinda, contact them to book uh, for me to come and all that stuff. So it's usually a process. But in this case... Um, God really put it on my heart and spirit that this is something that needed to be taken care of ASAP. So um, I absolutely made her a priority, and I'm very thankful that God guided me up there and worked through me to get rid of that garbage off of her. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm glad everything came together well and, and worked well, and, and you were able to get in there and help in time. And Wendy, what happens also is, mm -hmm. again, I don't just go in there and, you know, God works through me, takes the garbage off of the person, and then I just walk out and say, okay, have a nice life, see you later. <laughs> right, we, yeah. We, we sit down after that, and we put a game plan together for this person's life. So that's where the life coaching aspect comes in as well. So mm -hmm. we have to dissect 
what is going on uh, if the person is without job or has recently lost a job or is seeking another job, you know, looking for a calling in life or whatever it is, you know, I have to sit down with that person. And I say, look, I want you to be real with me. Be totally honest with me. First of all, be honest with yourself. Secondly, be totally honest with me. And let's lay this out on the table and let's come up with some answers and solutions for where you need to be in your life, and more importantly, where God wants you and needs you to be. So it is a process, but it's amazing how it all comes together, and I'm just so thankful and grateful to God for working through me in this way, because I can't describe the feeling that I have, you know, when I'm leaving someone like this, and I know that God has worked through me to really help this person, uh, it's, uh, I, I guess the feeling is indescribable and it just, it brings me so much joy. Fantastic. Very cool. Yeah. It is. And, and you have been used, uh, as a, as a tool and as an instrument to, to help so many lives, uh, in the years since, since I've known you, uh, when you and I first started talking one another back in 2010, you were really just starting to, yeah. to do this, this type of ministry. So in this seven years that you've been doing this bill how many how many i don't like to call them clients but i mean that that's what they are but how many yeah. how many people have you have you assisted and have you helped travis it's got to be you know now probably in the thousands because we're talking i've traveled to hundreds of people uh, around america and i have done countless sessions international skype sessions you name the countries it's unbelievable the uh, amount of different countries that people have come to me for help, and I've been able to provide those services for them via Skype. And uh, so it's probably in the thousands now of, of people that God has worked through me to help. Well, I know that, like I said, since you, know, since you and I have been talking with one another, uh, working together for the past you know, seven, seven and a half years, uh, every time I talk to you, it seems like the instances of deliverance and, and the spirit, spiritual battles that you deal with, it seems to increase exponentially each year. Oh, absolutely. And now it's at an all-time high. It's, it's just amazing. I, uh, this past Saturday, I appeared at the uh, Maryland Paranormal Conference and again, it was a uh, big thank you to Peter Franks and uh, and Ed as well and Dr. Resta. Uh, it was a great event, and again, it was very close to home, so I, it was really appealing to me uh, on that aspect. And even there, as I gave my lecture, and um, they had a table set up for me to where I was selling copies of Dark Force, and um, people approached me there asking me for help and you know i booked some people out of there for deliverances and uh one lady uh she wants me to travel to atlanta to help her son and um uh, it's just amazing people just come to me from so many different places and and if they find out about me if i'm going to an area somehow the people find out that i'm coming to that area and it always ends up to where i'm helping four five six seven sometimes up to <laughs> ten people uh, in an area, when they find out I'm coming in that area, they they get in contact. Well, I I know that you are a very very sought after um, personality uh, for not only the paracons and things like that, but when people do find out that you're there, they do they do want your help, they want your advice, they want your counsel, um, your input on what's going on in their lives. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and again, I'm thankful to God for giving me the courage to be able to speak about some things that a lot of people won't speak about. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to damage their reputation. They don't want to take that step out there that could hurt their career or something like that. I really don't care because, the, you know, there's a lot more to life and the life we're in than worrying about getting a TV show or, or anything else about my standing or popularity or whatever it is. Now, I love people, make no mistake, and I would do anything to help anybody. But I am not, my focus is not on um, 
you know, popularity or gaining. Uh, if, if somebody wants me to star in a TV series, fantastic, wonderful, great. If not, I really don't care. I'm quite happy and content with what God has blessed me with. And so, therefore, I have no fear about speaking about things that make some others uncomfortable, and others would never to dare go there and touch it. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I spoke about it at this Maryland Paranormal Conference uh, this past Saturday. I spoke about some things like that, and people were just blown away because nobody is talking like this. And um, it's true. So I don't have any reservations about speaking uh, on these things because I have no doubt that they are true. So the truth is the truth. There's no substitute for it, and sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. So that's certainly where we are on some of these topics that I speak about. So let's talk about some of the things that are apparently taking place in society and in the world around us. Uh, and I don't know where you want to start. I'll let you choose the starting point. Do we start with the Mandela effect? Do we start with uh, the current rash of UFO sightings? Do we start with the e the ecological issues that are going on with like Hurricane Harvey and, and the way that it's devastating this country? Do we talk about uh, the racial tension and the Antifa, the white supremacists and tearing the country apart there? Where do we let's start? talk about it all. And let's start <laughs> by saying... Uh, you know, my heartfelt, deepest sympathies uh, go out to the people in Texas, uh, in the Houston area. I spent quite a bit of time recently in the Houston area. I've traveled there quite a bit uh, in Corpus Christi and places like that, Galveston. And I love those people down there. I love Texas. And my heart goes out to them. And for those uh, who have lost their lives down there, you know, my deepest heartfelt uh, condolences to those people and uh, God is with you and I'm praying hard and I know that uh, Travis, Wendy and you are as well and, and oh, yeah. millions of other Absolutely. people in America and uh, anything that I could do to help in any way, you better believe I will I just donated 8,000 air miles um, for the people in Houston, for the uh, for the Red Cross down there, and I've donated monies as well, and I urge others, if you can afford it, now if you can't afford it, don't do it, but if you can afford it, uh, right. please consider making a donation to help those people out down there, because this is um, a disaster of epic proportions, and it's not over with yet, and this is something, they're still getting rain down there. And, and the people in Louisiana as well, we can't forget about them. They've gotten hammered pretty hard. So all the people that have been affected from this Harvey, uh, and I have to tell you guys this, and I could be wrong about this. I can't prove this, but I saw a video, and if that video is accurate, if it's true, boy, oh, boy, um, there was this video that showed satellite imagery of Harvey as it was, mm -hmm. you know, getting in the position. Now, again, we know that in this day and age, things can be manipulated, and I can't rule that out. However, if what I saw is true, then it shows on that satellite imagery that something, it was this white dot and all of a sudden, it was like a portal of some sorts formed around this white dot, and then the dot shot into the storm like a projectile, and when it did, <clears throat> the whole storm just exploded outward. So it made a very large storm a monster storm. Now, I don't know what that's about. A, is it true? I can't prove it. B... If it's true, who did it? And I'm starting to think more and more, based on what I am seeing, that it is not human beings behind some of these things that are taking place. Ronald Reagan said this many, many years ago in an address to the United Nations, uh, is not uh, an alien threat already among us. And so... I'm starting to think this more and more, that the devil is in the details here, and whether it is 
these uh, reptilians that are part of the satanic kingdom that have come onto the earth and they're trying to take over. Something is going on here, and I do not believe that in some of these cases, human beings are behind this. And what I do know, for sure, based on my work and my experiences, that the devil operates in certain ways. And his M.O. is to divide and conquer. So Mm -hmm. if he can create division, it makes it much easier for him and his minions to come right on in. And that is what is taking place currently in our country. Now, I'm very, very encouraged to see people from all colors and races joining in, helping each other down there in Texas and Louisiana. I'm very encouraged to see this. Absolutely. Prior to that, prior to that, we have seen so much division in our nation and this divisiveness was created in my opinion, over the last eight years, and it has gotten worse now, and a solution is going to come to this. God is going to make a way to repair this. But I really believe that the devil is in the details, and he is doing this to divide our nation. And like Travis uh, mentioned, this Antifa, uh, and then the white supremacist and all this stuff, um, these are ingredients to creating the perfect storm of conflict and division and violence, um, loss of life, um, loss of freedom. All these types of things are ingredients into this recipe for disaster. So um, my mantra is going to be right back to the way it was. United, we are strong. Divided, we are conquered. So people really need to take a step back, put their emotions in check, and say, okay, how do we begin to work together? How can we heal our nation from this division? How can we change our mindsets from hatred because one doesn't agree with my beliefs and philosophies, to I will respectfully agree to disagree with you, yet we can work together. We can come together in making our nation better for all. And so we are having this horrific event you know, in Texas, Louisiana, and all those places down there. But the encouraging thing is to see uh, all the different races and colors working together. And people are coming together as Americans, and they're helping each other. And it's a beautiful thing to see. And like 911, uh, we see that horrific tragedy really brings out the best in Americans. Now, I pray we never have another horrific, tragic event ever again. Uh, I certainly don't want to see that. But isn't it amazing that it takes something to that magnitude to be able to stir emotion in people to say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to put my thoughts and feelings uh, aside and my beliefs and opinions aside because I have to help these people. I have to do my part in being an American. And when we are true Americans, we will take that step forward and we will go the extra mile to help someone. So may that trend continue. And I pray that God will work through me in an even greater way to try and bring people together and try and get people to realize that we are faced with a threat from outside. And that threat is trying to destroy us from within. And as Ronald Reagan said, the differences would suddenly evaporate 
if people realized that we were faced with this outside threat, we would lay down our differences and join together to fight against this outside threat. And I am convinced of it now, based on these things that are taking place, this Mandela effect and all these other things, that we are being attacked and infiltrated by an outside threat. And I want people to wake up and realize this so we can come together as one to combat this. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that resonates with what you're saying, Bill, is, is especially talking about, you know, the I, I'm very familiar with the speech that you're that you're talking about when, when Reagan was addressing the United Nations there. Yeah. Um uh, talking about, you know, he, he'd often pondered what would happen if uh, the world was faced with an alien, outside alien threat, would, you know, would all of the differences and all of the petty differences not be put aside and we would come together to fight that alien force. And then he did go on to say, but I ask you, are we not already, or is, is an alien presence not already among us? And, and a lot of people have debated and, and there's been a lot of dialogue about what he meant by that. Was he... Um, was he giving a hint uh, of what he as president had, you know, was, was privy to the knowledge that he had as far as extraterrestrials? Was he hinting at a new world order? Was he talking about, uh, you know, uh, supernatural powers at work behind the scenes? Or was he just speaking, you know, metaphorically? And I think, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, a room for debate and, and speculation in that regard. But as I listen to you talk and as, you know, we start bringing – all of these things into perspective, the the tension in the country, the natural disasters, uh, the UFO sightings, all of those things. You and I have had this discussion, you know, in, in, in biblical prophecy, uh, which a lot of uh, individuals will, will hearken back to. That, you know, there are those signs of the last days, signs in the heavens, signs in the weathers, not being able to tell seasons apart, those types of things that are outlined there. And we do begin to see a little bit of that. Uh, the more that we that we live and, and, and the longer that we are on this planet and and the more we grow and evolve as as human beings but then you also look at the the amount of hatred and the amount of of, of division and racism all those things that seem to be bubbling to the surface and you look at that in direct correlation to the Mandela effect and you talking about changes literal changes in our perceived reality uh, yes. from from memories to books to TV shows, that everything, that the very fabric of our reality is being brought into question. And that that really is a sobering thought to actually begin pondering. I totally agree. And, you know, and Ronald Reagan's speech took place on September 21st, 1987, and it was a speech given to the United Nations. And he's quoted as saying, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? So he definitely knew something, I believe, that uh, he knew something was on the horizon and maybe an infiltration had taken place even back then. And, and this is part of a, a mass mind conditioning. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of our youth now is that uh, they have been under this mass mind control from media, from music, certain music and, uh, you know, uh, TV shows and movies and um, you name it. Uh, there is absolutely a target that has been put on our youth for many years now, and it is absolutely a mind-conditioning, brainwashing program to... Uh, just absolutely resist any type of authority or even any type of advice, and there's no morals, no respect, uh, no decency, and not all. I mean, there's some great uh, young people out there, but uh, we see more times than not these despicable displays. Uh, for instance, I just saw a video of these Antifas um, that uh, I'm not sure where it was, somewhere in California. They go to the places where they know that there's not going to be any resistance, so they want to go to those liberal places to where they know uh, groups of uh, some real resistance will not be there. So they went, and anyway, uh, this one guy who's in a mask, uh, you know, they dress in black and these black masks and all this stuff, and he 
took this bottle of water from this elderly man who I guess was a, a war veteran. And he, so the man's in the middle of the Antifa crowd, you know, voicing his displeasure with him. This man's in a wheelchair. And this idiot goes up and takes the man's water bottle and then starts dumping it all over him and everything. This man is yeah. in a wheelchair. This man is in a country. And I'll tell you what, uh, I'm a minister and I love everybody and I would do anything to help anyone. But I'll tell you, uh, I, I'm thinking to myself, it wouldn't take much for me. I could very easily assemble a force of people uh, to go and have an answer for those individuals, and they would not like it, that's for sure. So uh, it, it just really, really boils my blood to see anybody uh, persecuted or victimized in any way. And it, it just, there has to, I'm praying that President Trump will come up with some sort of comprehensive plan to stop this. He's vilified no matter what he does. But at this point, if I were him, I wouldn't care because you have to do what's best for the country. And if these people are acting out, and look, everybody has the right to protest. I understand that. That comes under the First Amendment. I understand that. Uh, however, and this goes for the white supremacists as well. Uh, if you were doing things that get into acts of violence against others, and, and now you have potential for loss of life, something has to be done. And if I were in power, I would absolutely be sending out the National Guard to those areas where these individuals are, and they would be rounded up, and that would be the end of that. No, something, I mean, some, there, there has to be a, um, a show of, a show of, of some kind by leadership. Uh, and I agree with you and, and we've, we've, we've had this discussion on here. I mean, I, I think everyone has the right to, to march and to demonstrate and to voice their concerns. I have a real problem. And I, and I said this on the show a couple weeks ago, I have a real problem. I just really cannot for the life of me imagine any reason that an American, whether they're male or female, could possibly defend waving a Nazi flag after what we know about the Nazis and what we know that they did, and 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 the evil that that actually gave birth to that that form of of power there in Germany. Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, it it's is. horrible. I, I I don't agree with it one bit. Um, I just say this. For both sides, it's time to stop this. It's time to eliminate the hate. It's time to come up with solutions. So as long as there are opposing sides and these strong views on how it should be, then nothing will ever change. And it's not going to move forward. You cannot possibly move forward when you can't even have any kind of civil dialogue. Right. So... Um, there are no answers when you have that type of mindset. So I say to them on both sides, I urge you to stop, take a deep breath, think about what you're doing, what you're saying. Uh, and if you really want change in our nation for the better, then I say let's everybody come together and work together, strive to do the best that we can do and be the best that we can be and follow the example that Jesus taught and set in saying that it is all about being selfless. And I mean, we're, we're getting a prime example of this right now down in Houston and those areas down there. The, I saw a video where these people made a human chain uh, going through waters that were coming up past their chest and, and they put their lives on the line in this human chain to rescue this lady out of her vehicle that was sinking. The water, she was in her vehicle, the water was coming up, uh, uh, it was getting near the roof. And they uh, made this chain and risked their lives, white, black, uh, it, color didn't matter at this point. They joined together as Americans because they came together to save this person's life, and they did it, and I applaud them. And that is what real Americans do, and people need to stop this and take a step back and say, wow, we can accomplish great things when we come together in this way. It's I'm, I'm not gonna... rocket science. 
I, I'd like to interject with that, though, that I, I would prefer it be the human race instead of just Americans. I'd like to see everybody everywhere do that. And and they might, given the right uh, circumstances. But, uh, you know, it's not just Americans. It's not just black and white. It's it's everybody, everything, everywhere, in my opinion. Well, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a right. great thought. But we're in America here, Wendy, and this is, again, in this country. If you're in this country, then you are an American, and Americans need to have that mentality again. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love people all around the world, and God has worked through me to help people all around the world. I also, I did tell you guys this, on my way to the deliverance uh, today, uh, I was performing an over-the-phone deliverance for a lady in Belfast, Ireland. So um, I do have these inter- international connections with people, and I love everybody, mm-hmm. but I think that it has to start from within first, and if we can have that focus and mindset on, hey, look, we really need to do the best that we can do and be the best that we can be here and be proud Americans to uh, say, look, you're going to see the very best of us. Then that goes out to the world because really the world revolves around America, whether people believe that or not or want to believe it, it is the truth. And so the world revolves around this country. So we should be the ones, and we used to be this way, we were the guys that wore the white hat. We were the guys that set the example. We were the mm-hmm. guys that everybody in the other countries admired. We need to get back to that way again. And if we can do that, then that sets the tone for all nations. Agreed. So Absolutely. let's pray that that's exactly what happens. And I'm certainly going to do anything I can to help anybody in any way that I can to help to spur um, these thoughts about, hey, you know, let's drop the hatred and let's start being productive. Let's start seeking the answers and let's start moving forward. So if we're moving forward, then that means we're going to get busy living. And if we're going to get busy living, then we should get busy winning. Indeed. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, Bill... Going back, kind of bringing this back to some of the, the topics of the show tonight, let, talking about how this world is changing, yeah. how mentality is changing, the Mandela effect. I had never heard of the Mandela effect until you mentioned it on the show probably a year, year and a half ago, and you have come back on, you've updated us about things that are changing, memories that are changing, books that are changing, TV shows, entertainment, all of these things where our perception of reality seems to be altered. It sounds like crazy talk. And you guys probably thought I was crazy when I first started, you know, when I first came on the show well, talking about this. But Wendy did. Wendy did. I always believe everything. Well, yeah, but I think that about every guest. <laughs> <laughs> you should hear what she says about me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Look, I heard the opening of the show, and I thought, how am I going to follow that? <laughs> you guys could have just rolled on for two hours about that that would have been it well you know it happens sometimes but <laughs> we prefer to talk to an outsider you know to add to well, our... i could have i yeah. could have mediated the uh you know the back and forth there <laughs> next time we'll have a show like that i'll be the mediator moderator and there we uh, go. i'll give each of you like uh you know two minutes a piece to to voice it, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll we'll segue through in that way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. No, but okay. I mean, the, not, not the, the Mandela, referee. The, that makes you a referee. Referee be more like it, yeah. For for <laughs> Wendy, I would be more like that. <laughs> I'll be wearing a white and black striped shirt. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, as for this Mandela effect, and and this was coined. Uh, by a lady named Fiona Broom, who is some sort of psychic or something. I don't know the lady. I don't know who she is. I never heard of her. Um, But according to this uh, lady, she was having these, she had encountered this, that she was seeing things different from her recollections and perception. And so she started questioning things. And and things like uh, some people thought that Nelson Mandela and the Mandela effect is coined after Nelson Mandela. Um, A lot of people thought that he died, I think, in 1991. 
and some people remember a funeral and all these things. And, mm-hmm. um, well, uh, do you remember it? Yeah, Wendy? I did. Do you remember? Okay. I, or at least I, I thought, thought I did. I, did. Mm-hmm. I okay. thought I did as well. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, really, I remember that. And then you think, well, maybe I could be mistaken. Maybe it was somebody else. But I, like you, really think that I remember that. And yet, uh, he died again. I think it was in 2013. So, uh, (laughs) Billy Graham the same way. Uh, They say that Billy Graham died in, I think, 1996. And they had this big funeral. And one guy I was on a show with, and he swears. He said, I'm telling you, I was sitting on the couch with my mother, who was crying because she loved Billy Graham so much. And they had this big funeral for him and everything. Billy Graham is still alive. <laughs> oh, man, that was I, a I don't get it. Yeah, I, wishful thinking. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, and he swears. I mean, he was on the show with me, and he mm-hmm. swears that he was on the sofa with his mother, and she was just absolutely just despondent over the passing of Billy Graham, and they were watching the funeral on TV. And no. how do you refute that? You know, where did that come from? Don't uh, no right. idea. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I <laughs> personally don't remember that. I don't, and not saying that it didn't happen. I really, I personally don't remember it. I, I want to say that I do, but I really don't um, remember that. I, nowadays, you know, nothing is, uh, if you can imagine it, that it's likely possible. But, um there are just many other things as well, like uh, the um, the book and then the movie. Remember that that movie, uh, Interview with a Vampire. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, now it's called Interview with the Vampire. Well, I think I always remember Interview with the Vampire, but I might be mistaken on that. I have a Swiss cheese memory, to you know, these days. It's just. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the Perenstein Bears. Mm-hmm. That is now Perrin Stain Bears. I oh, changed the E different. with an A. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I remembered it being spelled oddly, but still being pronounced Baron Stain Bears. But yeah. then again, maybe not. <laughs> Power of suggestion. Remember Oscar Meyer. Remember the little kid. That sang the jingle. My baloney has a second name, M E Y E R. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not anymore. Oscar Meyer is spelled with an A now. Oscar Mayer. M A Y E R. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> but I clearly remember that little kid singing that jingle over and over and over again, how his baloney was spelled M E Y E R. Right. Okay, and I'm thinking I remember it's spelled M A Y E R. <laughs> See, yeah, and and who's That's right? Amazing. We're both right, possibly. Know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and then there's Snow White, mirror, mirror on the wall. You guys yeah. remember that? Oh yeah. Yes. I definitely remember that mirror, mirror yes. on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Right. Yes. Yeah. She scared the heck well, out of me. It doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> Oh? It now says magic mirror on the wall. No, that's wrong. Okay. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> no. <laughs> yep. I then, check that one, period. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Magic mirror on the wall. How about that? And then the famous line from the movie Star Wars, where James Earl Jones you know, says to Luke Skywalker, Luke, I am your father. Mm-hmm. Right. It now says, no, I am your father. Okay. Interesting. So, so they took Luke out and put no in. No, I hmm. And the movie Field of Dreams, the famous line out of there, if you build it, they will come. Remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah. Wendy, do you remember that? Yes, I do. Yeah. Now it says, if you build it, he will come. Ah, now, I might have a a, a viable 
uh, <laughs> explanation for that one. When it starts, it's if you build it, they will come. But the very last one, when they're speaking more specifically about his father, um, <clears throat> not Luke or or uh, James, <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, um, uh, Kinsella. Uh, I, I I forget the his first name, but um, that the very last one, if you build it, he will come. Is is the last way they say it? I think. No, they're saying that the the word they, which I've seen the clip mm-hmm. myself, and if you punch mm-hmm. it up for yourself, if you punch it up right now, Field of Dreams, mm-hmm. uh, if you build it, they will come. It will say, mm-hmm. if you build it, he will come. Well, the little girl said, if you build it, or no, that was people will come. Hmm. No, it was the, yeah, the famous line was, if you build it, they will come, and now they mm-hmm. is replaced with he. he. Mr. Rogers. Uh, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Do you guys remember Mr. Rogers and the Mr. Rogers theme song? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Annoying as hell. Yes. Just he was too, way, too, way too upbeat. If you punch that in right now, Mr. Rogers' theme song, it will not say it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It will say it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> hmm. now, I know darn well, and I know darn well, all the times I saw that Mr. Rogers and heard that jingle, that it said it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Now, it says it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Maybe he had to get more specific. <laughs> <laughs> now, think about that, because you're you're talking about a clip that, you know, Mr. Rogers was around in the late 60s into the 70s. And mm-hmm. now think about that. How do you manipulate? If you punch it in right now, Google it. Mr. Rogers theme song. For those mm-hmm. out there listening right now, Google it. And if you Google that and play it, he will say it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. How do you change... You know, with all these uh, movie things and all this, how in the world can you manipulate and change the wording in these things that happened years ago? Mm -hmm. The movie Charles, we're going to need a bigger boat. Remember that line? Oh, yeah. Richard Dreyfuss? Now he says, you're going to need a bigger boat. But it was all of them going out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the movie Silence of the Lambs. Mm-hmm. The Never famous line from that movie. Remember the famous line from that movie? Well, there's several. Which one? Clarice. Hello, Clarice. Clarice, yes. It no longer exists. <clears throat> the line is gone. It doesn't exist in the movie anymore. So if you Google or, or YouTube or whatever, Silence of the Lambs, that line, hello, Clarice, does not exist anymore. It's just excised out? It is gone. And that was the main line. That was the line everybody quotes. That You know, I mean, that was the, the when you identify with that movie, mm-hmm. that was the line. Yeah. It's gone. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, the Forrest Gump movie. The famous line out of Forrest Gump. Mama said, life is like a box of chocolates. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yep. Yes, right. absolutely. Now it says, and again, you don't have to take my word for this. Google it up. Now it says, Mama said, life was like a box of chocolates. Well, that mm. doesn't even make sense. No. Hmm. A lot of things don't make sense anymore. And, and so that's just a few of many, many changes that have taken place um, in our world, in our everyday uh, lives. There are many more. I could go on and on. But what really disturbs me the most, even more so than those changes, are the changes that have taken place in the Bibles. And they started with the King James Bibles, Mm -hmm. and now they are moving on to other Bibles. And I mean hundreds of changes in Scripture, in wording, 
just unbelievable words like matrix, bank bottles, butler, unicorn, naughty, gay, gorgeous stuff, couch, kisseth, space, mm-hmm. flesh hooks, Jupiter, suburbs, highways, tires, mufflers, published ravens, confederacy, dwarves. We have a bonix in the Bible now. We be of Abraham's seed. Uh, oven, pomegranates, oracles, monsters, frying pans, ranges, pots, creditor, evil figs, medicine, and many other words that were never in the Bible. They are in there now. There's one word called crookbacked. Crookbacked. What is now, that? If you, punch the, if, yeah, if you punch that word up, it, you get on Webster Online. For those who are listening right now, don't take my word for this. Go into Webster Online and punch in the word crookbacked. So it's crookback with a T, crookbacked. Punch that word in, and no such word exists. Yet there it is in the King James Bible. Hmm. Uh, this is one that's been in your uh, been in your possession for years, correct? The King James have, uh, Bible. I have four oh. King James Bibles. One mm-hmm. is 157 years old, given to me by my good friend Scott Moreau. Uh, oh, another sweet. one is 20 years old that travels with me everywhere I go, all over the country. And I have two other ones here in my office. And plus a home and study Bible that is on my desk in my office. And so how is it possible that an external force with these mind-boggling technological capabilities can come into one's home, into one's private possessions, and make these changes. But that's exactly what has happened here. I'm not talking about changes that came out of the printer. And some people don't get it. They say, oh, well, you know, they change things all the time. They revise these additions. And I say to them, I am not talking about Bibles that have come off the printing presses. I'm talking about our personal Bibles that are in our possession, that have been in our possession for many, many years, that are now changed supernaturally. So Leviticus 21 verse 20 says, or crookbacked, that is C-R-O-O-K-B-A-C-K-T. Punch that in, and it will, Webster will tell you that no such word exists. Or a dwarf. Dwarf was never in the Bible, and it's in there now. Or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy or scabbed, or hath, hath his stones broken. That is Leviticus 21, verse 20. Hmm. Yeah, that one. So, that one. Patrick. Uh, Patrick. <laughs> Travis has to feel. <laughs> Yeah, no. So what we're talking about here, because we, we've discussed this on the show before, too, Bill, you know, you're talking about Bibles in our possession. Now, have, is this happening to other pieces of literature as well? Or have you have you looked at that yet? I haven't looked uh at any other. And I'm certain now and I haven't really studied into it yet, but I will. Um I'm certain that if this is taking place in the Bibles, and if it's taking place in movies, Mm -hmm. uh, then I'm certain it's going to take place in pieces of literature. Uh, I have heard about it. Now, I haven't seen it for myself, but I have heard about it that there are now words replaced or preposterous things in certain types of books that would have never been there. Uh, So we'll see. I'm going to, when I get more time, I'm going to dig into it. Uh, but it would not surprise me for one second. Mm-hmm. And just just a scripture like this. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, Travis was a pastor himself. He was a minister, and he is very well versed in the Bible and the scriptures, and he knows the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so when I say these things, um, he knows what I'm talking about. And, mm-hmm. and so I know the Bible very well. I spent many years in study, so I would never make these types of claims if they were not true. I would right. not make myself look like an idiot or a liar. I have nothing to gain by this at all. So that said, 
there are preposterous scriptures now, like Numbers 11, verse 12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father? That, that line was always nursing woman. Mother, right. And nursing woman beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. Now it says nursing father. Which makes no sense. Do you guys, sense. Know, do you guys know of a man that can nurse? A baby can nurse off of a man? No. <laughs> so that leads me to the next one, which is Job 21, verse 24, which used to read, His body is well fed, and his bones are moistened with marrow. Now it reads, His breasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. His breasts are full of milk? Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's kind of, yeah. Right. Hmm. Wendy, it's preposterous. I mean, right. this is just... Uh, so it's things like this Excuse me. where you look and you say, okay, what in the world is going on here? It never read that way. Never, ever read that way. And now all of a sudden we have men with breasts that are full of milk. Wow. Uh, but men don't even have the right uh, the, the hormones and, and <laughs> things right. to, oh. to make that happen. So that's just... Uh, I mean, I guess we could get gross, but I really don't want to. Um, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We know it's not possible. Right. So, you Bill... Know, so I mean... No, <laughs> go ahead, brother. No, no, I was going to say, so what is... I know you can't give us a definitive explanation, but what is the possible explanation for why and how this is happening? Okay. This is my take on it. And again, <laughs> um... I'm not there, and even if I were there, I wouldn't be able to understand it anyway, because this technology is so far beyond my understanding, and probably most human beings' understanding, that it's unfathomable. So I believe that this is happening. The devil is absolutely in the details, so he's behind this. And God is allowing this for a short time, because in my opinion, this is the great deception. And I've taken this to so many people, like these so-called... Uh, big shots in the uh, Christian community and these people that uh, are mega pastors and have these mega churches and have these, you know, credentials that uh, go from here to the length of your arm and all this stuff and, and others. And, you know, like uh, motor mouth Alex Jones, who's always, uh, you know, on something every day. It took this to him and to other people. Nobody will touch this. They won't touch it. It's supernatural with Sid Roth and all these things. They won't go near it. They won't touch it. They don't want anything to do with it. So that tells me that they are either sold out or they are just terrified. So uh, I believe the devil is in the details here, no doubt about it. I believe that this ha is happening through the CERN device, which is under the ground in Switzerland, which is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the Particle Collider. Um, they are opening, in my opinion, um, vortexes and doorways and portals, and I believe that uh, some of these demonic entities are coming through. And so more and more of these type, types of entities are coming through into our world via CERN, and I also believe that CERN is working in conjunction with these D-Wave quantum computers. Now, there's a man named Jordy Rose that is the Pied Piper for these D-Wave computers, and he calls them the greatest thing since sliced bread. And he says that they have what sounds like heartbeats, and, and they can solve problems at light speed, and... Um, they are capable of things that the human mind just can't fathom. Now, what they really are is devices, again, working in conjunction with the uh, CERN device that are opening up portals and doorways, and they are getting information from intelligences outside of our world. That's what these things really are. And there's supposedly only three of them. 
in existence right now. And NASA has one, and Google has one, and uh, I don't know if you said NSA has the other one. There are three of them. And so he was saying that he would get on his knees and worship it as an alien god and just going on and on and on about, you know, how amazing these things are and what they can do and just so far beyond human understanding. Well, there's an end game to this, in my opinion. And I think the end game is that, and we see this theme as well. So we've seen two major themes in our country for the last number of years. And and let me start by saying that I love all people and, and I don't hate anyone and I don't have anything against anybody. But I'm saying this because it's true. And two of the bigger agendas in our country uh, over the last eight, nine years or whatever, maybe ten, uh, the homosexual agenda and then uh, here more recently, the transgender thing. And there's a reason for this, because this leads to the next big thing. And the next big thing has already started. It's the transhumanism. And so uh, the end game in this is if you get people thinking differently and if you get people thinking that they're not happy, you know, being a man or a woman and, and they want to trade and be either, you know, either or, um, then you could take them to the next level to where they will think they're not happy being human anymore. So in my opinion, I think the end game here is that you can get the masses to take the mark of the beast, which will be a chip, which some people are already getting chipped. Um, if you can present, and whether it's this Jordy Rose or whomever the Pied Piper will be for this, there will be an announcement. And I believe this announcement will come sooner than later, where they will say they have the greatest technological discovery in the history of mankind. And if people will come down and get this, receive this chip, they will become immortal. They'll never die. They'll never get sick again because they will be merged with the D-Wave quantum computer and it will keep them free from death and free from sickness and pain and, and life. You'll be immortal, so you'll be like a god, and you'll just live forever, and that is the end game. And that is the great part of the great deception. To where, and millions of people are going to do this. Millions of people are going to fall for this hook, line, and sinker. They're going to go right down, and they're going to get chipped, and then they're going to be cut off from God, and it's end game. Game over. And when the enemy is defeated again, which uh, that's on the way to happening. Uh, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to go down with him because they will take this chip. So I'm warning people, uh, I've been warning people, and I'm warning them again here and now. Don't fall for this. If this scenario does come into play, like I'm saying, I urge you, pray about all things first, and even pray that if what I'm saying here is true. Uh, if, in fact, it is true, then I'm urging you not to be one of those who will follow along and get this chip, which I believe is the mark of the beast, and it will be the end game. So what I think did you, that's what this is all about. What did you think of this this corporation, this techno, tech corporation in um, Nebraska or Wisconsin uh, that, had, that had their employees res, uh, have the chip implant? I feel sorry for them because they have been deceived. And now they have been tricked into something that um, is going to cost them the ultimate price, in my opinion. And I wish them well, pray for them, God bless them. But they have been deceived into doing something really, really bad. Right. We are, you know, theoretically rational, uh, cognitive, you know, people, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it's great to get your dog or your cat chipped, Um in case they got lost and couldn't tell somebody how to, how, you know, hey, my name is such and such, help me. But, uh, yeah, for people, it's just very, very wrong. you got to think about this. Mm -hmm. Now there is a foreign object inside of your body 
that has yep. technology far beyond our understanding. So that means, now, everybody, take a moment and think about what I'm saying here. If there is such a foreign body in you that has this technological capability, that means there's somebody at the other end of a computer and a keyboard that can press keys that can make some very bad things to happen to that person who is chipped. You get out of line, okay, we're going to type up some stuff here and create a frequency and a pulse and a wave um, and a vibration that will cause this person <laughs> to die of a heart attack or whatever it is. Now, mm -hmm. I know this sounds like crazy talk, but if a person has this kind of technology inside of them, then the sky is the limit. Anything is possible and anything can happen. And, and I have this uh, visualization in my head, a scenario of a person that has taken this chip and then they go, oh, man, what have I done? I don't want this. I don't want to be a part of this. And then the powers that be, uh, you know, are aware that this person is a malcontent and could be causing trouble. What's well, going to be end game for that person? Probably at the stroke of a keyboard. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't even like the thought of, um, of vehicles being uh, electronically controlled remotely, remotely controlled. No way. Because, no you know, way. right, uh, in integrity in people is is just not that common anymore. Um, who knows, you know, what circumstances could be surrounding it. But um, yeah, I, I, no, it's not just not going to happen. Maybe I'm a control freak. I, I can freely admit that. But at the same time, uh, science fiction movies tell us that we shouldn't be going here. I totally agree. And like you, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. I, I would never, ever, under any circumstance, step into a vehicle where there is no driver. Yeah. Um, or even drive a vehicle that automatically wants to back up for me and all this kind of stuff. I just can't do it. There's no way. I will never see myself in a vehicle like that. Same here. And furthermore, over my dead body, will I ever <laughs> receive one of those chips? Uh, they would have to shoot me first. There's no way. I mean, I'm not ever, under any circumstances, going to have someone. And the way they place these chips... In the hand, it looks to me, you know, they go through the, uh, the, the index finger and the thumb, that area in between, oh. and into the fatty part of the hand there. But the way they uh, are, in, and they have this big needle where the chip is uh, the size of a grain of rice, right. and they insert it. But they make sure they put it so far under that, you know, there's no way a person could take a knife or something and say, I'm going to cut my hand open and get this out. It, it, it ain't happening. It's exactly so what they do to placed. dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've got it placed to where you're not going to be able, even if you wanted to, you're not going to be able to remove that. Right. So that's a scary thought. And, uh, again, <laughs> I'm not trying to scare people, but I want people to be alert and awake because this is really happening. This stuff isn't coming. It's here. And 20 years ago, I was telling people that these days were going to come, and they thought I was insane. They thought I was a conspiracy theorist. They, uh, people would call me crazy and all this. Well, here we are. And some of those very same people now say to me, wow, you were right. All that stuff's happening now. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, uh, Kimberly Stein is in the, the chat room, and she wanted me to tell you hello and that her husband made it in. Praise God, and and God bless uh, Kimberly and her husband, and her, her husband Albert has uh, been going through a battle with cancer himself, and oh, we pray for him, and we pray Absolutely. for a total healing miracle for him, and they too are from Texas. They uh, they live in the Fort Worth area, mm. and um, so they're, they're not being affected by this, but um, they're great people, and I certainly... Uh, prayers are with Albert, and I pray for a total healing miracle for him. Absolutely. And I found something interesting as well, and I found this uh, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 11.6, and we've talked about this before, is one of the most popular scriptures out of the Bible. And this scripture has inspired artwork and statues, and even Elvis sang about it in a song. And, uh, I found this 
I think it was sent to me, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the Jesus of Nazareth movie. Remember that? It came out in 1977. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert Powell played the part of Jesus. I think he played the best Jesus out of them all. But anyway, uh, in in that movie, he is talking with Barabbas. And when Barabbas comes to him and, and wants him to lead the revolt and all this stuff, you know, and, and Jesus tells him, look, you know, I'm not going to do this. It's a time for peace and love your enemies and forgive your enemies and all this kind of stuff. And, and so now... In Isaiah 11.6, that's the scripture where it used to say, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. And you guys right. remember this, right? Yes. Well, it doesn't say that anymore. It says the wolf. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. That's what it says now. So, so lion has been replaced with wolf. So in the 1977 Jesus of Nazareth movie, Robert Powell, who is playing the part of Jesus, says to Barabbas, Stacy Keach, who played the part of Barabbas, he says, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. That's Isaiah 11, 6. Well, mm -hmm. not anymore, because it says the wolf. So there you go. Interesting. And there was also a clip that I was sent, uh, from 1979, Eddie Murphy was doing a a mock, you know, one of his skits on Mr. Rogers. Yeah. And, and surprise, Murphy surprise, right? Singing in the, the little thing there, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. He didn't mm -hmm. say it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. He said it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. mocking how Mr. Rogers sang the song. But yet now, if you punch it in, Mr. Rogers says it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, I could just go on and on and on. And also, music is being changed. Lines and songs are being changed. Uh, song titles are being altered. It is just absolutely unfathomable, the things that are taking place. So business names are being changed. Do you remember the, the advertisements for Caldwell Banker? Yes. Vaguely. It doesn't say Caldwell Banker anymore. It says Coldwell. So they've replaced the A with an O. Coldwell Banker. Wow. Men's okay. Warehouse. Men's Warehouse was spelled like the word warehouse. Men's and then warehouse. Uh, mm -hmm. W-H. W-H-A-R. H-O-U-S-T. Now it's Men's Ware. R-E-A-R. House. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's another preposterous scripture, Ezekiel 24, verse 23. Now, it used to say, and your turbans shall be upon your heads and your shoes upon your feet, which even shoes is preposterous because they didn't wear shoes. They had sandals. So now right. shoes is replaced sandals and turbans was replaced with tires and your tires shall be upon your heads and your shoes <laughs> upon your feet. Okay. <laughs> it, well, well, hmm. <laughs> exactly right. And Ezra yeah. 9 verse 8 says, it used to say, and now for a little grace hath been showed from the Lord. Now it says, and now for a little space grace, space grace hath been showed from the Lord our God. These things just don't make any any sense any whatsoever. Sense. No, they don't. And, they do not. And, it, and another word uh, that was never there, and I went and researched some of these words, and there, some are 12th century words, and most are 14th century words, like bottles. And Mark 2.22, so in the Bible, water and wine were kept in skin. So Absolutely. skin of water or wine skin. <laughs> now, Mark 2.22 2, 2 says... And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else 
the new wine that burst the bottles and the wine is spilled and the bottles will be marred and new wine must be put into new bottles. Hmm. Okay. Well, I could see you wanting them in new skins because that would affect it, but not glass bottles. Yeah, bottles didn't exist back then. So I didn't no. think they uh, did. I, I couldn't I, remember exactly I, when glass came into being, but... Uh, <laughs> 12th century. And, and so then Matthew 26, 45. This is another, if you watch the Jesus films, Jesus of Nazareth or the other depictions of Jesus... He is so distressed, you know, in the final hour. He knows that the hour is at hand, and he's getting on his knees in the garden, and he's praying to God. He says, Father, if it were all possible, take this cup from me. He's so distressed, he's sweating blood because he knows what's coming, right? You guys know this narrative? Right. Okay, and he was mad at Peter because he's telling Peter, I need you to stay awake. I need you to keep them awake. The hour is at hand. Keep everybody awake. He got mad when they fell asleep. So, Matthew 26, verse 45, now reads, this is how preposterous this is, Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Sleep on now? Hmm. Does that make any sense to you? No, not at I all. I think I've heard that <laughs> phrase before, though, but I, I don't know where or why. He wouldn't be saying there, because, again, the hour is at hand. He is distressed. He mm-hmm. is sweating blood. He is seething mad at Peter for falling asleep, and he says, you guys need to be awake. They have to be awake, because they're coming to get me. Mm-hmm. So can you imagine, in this oh, yeah, hour no, you of distress... No. <laughs> He's going to say, sleep on now and take your rest because the hour is at hand. Okay. Uh. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, now I I remember the one, and you you can probably quote the, the exact uh, line and, and everything, but, um, but it, from the Lord's Prayer, where, you know, used to be, lead us not into temptation, forgive, you know, the, I forget, oh, yeah, forgive well, us our trespass. And yeah. now it's our debts, if I remember and correctly. Debtors, yeah, and you're, you're exactly right, Wendy. I'm mm-hmm. glad you brought it up because the Lord's Prayer is, or was, Our Father yeah. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And give us mm-hmm. this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forevermore. That's the way it used to be. Now yeah. it says, Our Father which art in heaven, mistake number one, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. Now it says in earth. doesn't say on earth anymore. It says in earth. We don't live in earth. Not that I know of, anyway. Um, And then, like Wendy said, uh, trespass and trespasses have been replaced with debts and debtors. Yeah, um, and I remember it, you know, being the the original in the original form so well that uh, at my aunt's funeral in uh, Nashville, uh, you know, I said it the old way, and the other people said it the other way, and I, and you know, people looked at me, and I was like, "That's not wrong. What? What? When did you change this?" <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it really and, is. And again, think about this. It is designed, these changes are designed to create confusion and division. Mm -hmm. Because where there's confusion, there is division. And where there's division, there is conflict. And where there's conflict, somebody's going to be conquered. So this is why I say, um, this is coming from an external force that is trying to divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in Luke 19.27 now, this and people will say, well, he was, uh, he was, he was, um, what was it? Jesus was uh, saying a parable in this, and I go, okay, well, Jesus would never ever speak this way ever 
never did in the reading that I had in the Bible, and, and certainly in my opinion would never speak this way. So Luke nineteen twenty seven, he's saying, uh, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, now I used to say show them, show them before me. Now it says, mm-hmm. but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Slay wow. them. That's Not very Christ-like. Difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big difference right there. And another one that is preposterous, Luke nineteen twenty three says, Wherefore then gave us not my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. Money? Bank? <laughs> Usury? And he needs it? Yeah. And yeah. He needs Interest? It? No. Right. <laughs> Don't think so. Okay. And then two more preposterous scriptures. Uh, Luke seventeen thirty four and Luke seventeen thirty five. Now these are two very well known scriptures also. And this is where Jesus is saying when that when the hour comes uh, for the um, the rapture that uh, he says I tell you in that night. There shall be two, and it used to be, um, it used to say there shall be a man and a woman in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Now it says, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two mm-hmm. men in one bed. Right. Then the next verse the, it always read, there will be two women grinding grain together at the mill. One will be taken, one will, will be left. Now it right. says, two women shall be grinding together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one shall be taken and the other left. Wow. So I guess, there you go. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just unbelievable. And so to further that, uh, you go to Revelation one thirteen. Now, in Revelation one thirteen, it used to describe Jesus as a commanding officer who had a gold sash going across his chest. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, it says, this is Revelation 1, verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot, and it girt about the paps. That is a bra across the breast, with a golden girdle. So now they're describing Jesus as a transsexual here, a bra across the breast. Hmm. Weird. What? Yeah, it just makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. Nope. And, uh, in John 4, verse 1, it talks about, and Travis, you remember this, because this is another very well-known scripture about testing the spirits. Yes. It doesn't say that anymore. It says try them, doesn't it? We've talked about That's this. right. It says, try, try the them. spirits. Beloved, believe not every spirit. This is John 4, verse 1. Beloved, uh, 1 John. 1 John uh, 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they have, are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the it used to be test, and now it's try. It just absolutely makes no sense at all. Hmm. And then, Crazy uh, stuff. Ezekiel, yeah, and it, here's one that I can't even recite on the air. Um, this is Ezekiel 23, verses 20 through 21. Um, it talks about these two sisters that went into whoredoms, and it never made the description like what it is now. And I can't even repeat it on the air. Uh, it's just unbelievable. You have to see it to believe it. Graphic, um, I'm guessing. Yes, to mm-hmm. say the least. It's incredible. And again, I could go on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is just absolutely amazing when you look at some of these things and you say it's just 
It's so ridiculous. I mean, Leviticus 7, verse 9 says, and all the meat offering that is bacon in the oven and all that is dressed in the frying pan and in the pan shall be the priest in a oven, frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> right. <What? laughs> Okie dokie then, right? <laughs> Just, it's, you know, and then Leviticus 11.35 goes on to say, and everything whereupon any part of their carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be oven or ranges or pots, they shall be broken down for their unclean. So we now have oven, ranges, and pots. <laughs> yeah, the, the ranges are definitely not, yeah, they, no, uh-uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, you just scratch your head, and you, you just uh, right because what well, hard to believe. Yeah, extremely. But but yet it's there. It's there in front of your face, and it is there. And now mm-hmm. Zechariah, uh, you should check this one out. Zechariah two <coughs> verse six. Now this is supposed to be this is supposed to be God talking. Zechariah uh, two verse six. Here's how it starts out. Ho ho. Come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. Ho, ho. <laughs> well, do you think it's Santa Claus? Exactly right. That's mm-hmm. been supposed to, that is uh, where they're <laughs> going with that. I, it's just absolutely mind boggling. Well, I could say that it would be hailing someone, you know, like getting their attention, saying hello, whatever, that kind of hail. Um, not not the frozen stuff falling from the sky, or that really, really warm place down below. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just but, uh, you know, again, it still doesn't... These things, yeah. Anybody, it's certainly someone that is well-versed in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's no way that they could possibly look at these things. And, and for those out there who doubt this, visit www.beingbiblechanges.com I've created this website uh, posting these changes on there and come look for yourself visit the site and see them for yourself and just be prepared to be shocked I mean it is shocking to see and get your Bible out or if you don't have a Bible punch up Bible Gateway or online King James and, and compare just like John 8 verse Three, three. So 833, John 833, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed. We be. It was always we are. We are Abraham's seed. Now it says we be. So ebonics have now come into the Bible. Unless it is some obscure uh, dialect used. No. No, the no. word okay. was we. Okay. The, the two words were we are. We okay. are Abraham's seed. That's the way I, it always I trust read. your word on that. Yeah, I just I was trying Travis, to think Travis, of it. A... Do you remember that? I do. Yeah, I mean it's, it's the God's honest truth. We are Abraham's seed. That's the way it read, and now it says we be. So Abonics have made their way in, and uh, John fourteen ten or John ten fourteen. I'm sorry, where Jesus says. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and they know me. Remember that scripture? Yes. Well, now it reads, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. That, okay. (laughs) And it probably doesn't come with translations, does it? (laughs) (laughs) It's just unbelievable. I mean, yeah. And that is the scripture that, again, is one of the more popular verses out of the Bible. You know, everybody who reads the Bible knows that. And another one that everybody knows, and people have um, depictions of this on their walls, you know, uh, frames, uh, or in the block lettering that you hang up on the walls for decoration. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, 
But the greatest of these is love. That's what it always said. Not anymore. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest thing is charity. So love has now been replaced with charity. And you have people, and I've been into some homes of my clients that have these things up on their walls in block lettering or frames or whatever it may be with the faith, hope, and love. And now it says faith, hope, and charity. Hmm. No explanations. I, guess, I don't you know. know. Again, now, if somebody has something like that on their wall, which one man uh, is a friend of mine. Uh, I went to help him and others up there in um, uh, Rhode Island. Um, he had that on his wall, and I was in his home and doing a blessing in his home. And I said, let me show you something. And so it was, he had it boldly displayed on his wall. And I showed him, and he couldn't believe it. He almost fell backwards when he looked. And I showed him 1 Corinthians 13, 13. He said, how can this be? There it is right on my wall. How can it be? How can it be changed like that? No clue. So, so again, yeah. in my opinion, mm-hmm. I believe that these things are being done to create confusion and division. Yeah. Because there are some people... Um, one man I had a debate with, which now he's become a friend, and I thank God for that, but um, he is a pastor, Bible scholar, uh, again, someone with credentials the length of an arm, and he didn't believe this, and he didn't want to believe this, and we debated about this on another show, and um, he has since become a friend, and he has an understanding, and he actually has sent me scriptures that I wasn't aware of that have been changed. So uh, he sees it now for what it is, and it's really hard to believe, and you don't want to believe it. You don't want to accept it. And it is so um, just strange in the sense that we have this preconceived notion of life and how life is or should be and what we call normal. So when we live in this this normal frame, quote-unquote normal, Um, it is what we expect in the course of a day. Um, It stays within those parameters, let's say it like that. So now we're talking about something that is totally out of those parameters. So this is uncharted territory. It's beyond our understanding. So it is very uh, weird to us, to say the least that we can't, and I know myself, when I first came to know of this, and I thank my friend Sophie over there in Scotland uh, for making me aware of this, because I didn't know anything about this until she sent me the the video that I didn't even want to watch. Um, And she's the one, as a matter of fact, that sent me the one, uh, the video about uh, Jesus of Nazareth, just made me think. So two times now she had sent me examples, and I thank her for that. on these changes. And I, when I saw it, and then even when I looked in my Bibles, and I saw that my Bibles were changed, uh, I almost fell into my chair. I mean, I just I couldn't believe it. Uh, but it took me a couple weeks to really reconcile it in my mind that this was real. You know, I kept thinking, how can this be? This can't be. I can't understand it. It's out of my understanding. And, and so this really puts people, especially people like me, who are, you know, a control freaks, want to be in control all the time and, and want to be uh, in control of the situation or have the understanding. Um, so that really, really boggles the mind when something like this happens and you're not in control of it, and nor do you have any understanding of it either, other than to give a broad opinion an analogy, you know, such as CERN and the D-Wave computers, which I very much believe that, uh, you know, the devil is in the details in using this type of technology, but I still don't understand it. It is so far beyond my understanding, I I guess I can't fathom it. 
yeah, there's uh, there's just no figuring some things out. I guess you know, it just it's too far out there. Uh, people of a certain mindset aren't going to be able to figure it out, uh, rationalize it, think it's okay. Mm-hmm. And and uh, during that debate, uh, Pastor Shrum said to me, he said, "Well, you know, you're you're trying to to get us to stop." believing in our Bibles, and, and if I don't have my Bible, I don't have anything. And I said, wait a minute, that's not true. You if always have your the, faith. Right. If the Bibles mm-hmm. were suddenly gone, every Bible suddenly gone from this planet, that will not for one second interrupt in any way, shape, or form my relationship and connection with God. It will not. And therefore, anyone who has deep faith and a deep connection and a real connection with God, you should never let that interrupt the connection. So it really doesn't matter. Yes, the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is not the infallible Word of God, but it is the inspired Word of God, and it's a wonderful resource. But people need to be careful because you don't want to get caught up in worshiping the Bible because Mm -hmm. our God, the Bible is not our God, and our God... Uh, wants us to come to him and have our personal relationship with him. And so uh, we just have to be very careful when it comes to those types of things. I am not anti-Bible. I'm not saying uh, anything bad about the Bible. I'm just stating the truth for what it is. And I didn't create this truth. Uh, I am merely reporting on it, um, as everyone should be. That You know, anybody that proclaims to be a Christian and, and proclaims, proclaims to have faith and a strong relationship with God, and anyone who knows the Bible surely must be seeing these changes. There is no way around it. Very true. Well, and then there's those of us who we question the Bible because it's, it, it, doesn't come, it hasn't come straight from the source for quite some time. And well, I been, agree copied, recopied with people with their own agendas, yeah. their own uh, <clears throat> twist on things, not even agendas, but yeah, you know, just, just their, how, uh, golly, you know, maybe they were diddled by the local priest or something, you know, that's, it, they're just never any telling. So, you know. Well, I had, it, a, I had oh, a debate many years ago with a mm-hmm. Bible scholar, Professor Bart Ehrman. He is the foremost Bible scholar in America. And this man was a pastor. And brilliant man, and he suddenly lost his faith and didn't want to be a pastor anymore and started engaging in these debates against pastors um, about the validity of the Bible and the alterations in the Bible. And here I engaged in this debate thinking that I was going to, you know, bring him back to God and Christianity, but what really happened was is he opened my eyes to what he was saying, that some of what he was saying was true, and the fact that um, the Bible has been altered, and, and from the very beginning, and there, you know, there were 66 books, there's 66 books in the King James, but there's really 600 books, so there are 534 other books out there, and, um, you know, there's not uh, four Gospels, there's 150 Gospels, and so there's a lot more to the story, and so, you know, Ehrman opened my eyes on that to where it really caused me to to really dig in and start to do some serious uh, historical studies and having a better understanding of the Bible. And, you know, my opinion, uh, Constantine the Great is the one who formed and shaped Christianity, and he had his scribes, um, you know, take this out, take that out, add this in. Uh, You know, I'll give you, for instance, the Book of Enoch is not in the Bible. It's not in the King James Bible. I don't think it's in any of the Bibles. Now, you're talking about a man that was so favored by God that God came down and walked with him, and then God had him taken up to all the levels of heaven to see all the secrets in heaven, the things that take place. I'd say that's a pretty favored individual. There's nobody else in the whole Bible, in the whole narrative, that had that kind of favor. Um, Right. And, and yet, mm-hmm. you won't find his book in there. Why is that? 
This is a man that had this great favor with God, and his book's not in the Bible? Sounds like so somebody that, else might have been a little jealous then. and Exactly, and it's a prime mm-hmm. example of men taking away and adding to. So they created um, this inspired work. Now, I believe the core message of the Bible, absolutely. I do believe that uh, that our glorious God, Yahweh, is the creator of all things, and I do believe that he created um, the Yahshua, Jesus the Christ, and he is the Son of God, the Messiah, and, and Yahweh saves through him. His name, Hebrew, is Yahshua, which means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves through him. So um, I believe that. I absolutely, absolutely believe that he had an everlasting covenant with David as well. And, and the narrative throughout all of the books in the Bible is that there is always one that is singled out, one that God puts his favor on that becomes like a savior to his people in different time frames, and that is the running narrative in the 66 books. So there's a lot more to the story than just the cookie-cutter versions that are taught in the churches. Uh, again, I do believe the core message of the Bible is absolutely true, but there is a lot more to the story. Yeah, the details are being changed according to the writer, the the, the copier, oh, the, the, the scribe, the winners, whatever. The winners write the history books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you that's, go. that's true, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's basically what it is. And I'm sure, you know, there would be some to hear this and say, oh, he's an antichrist. He's a this. No, I'm not. My relationship is very strong with God and God has great favor on me. And I thank him and praise him for that. But I'm a truth seeker. So mm-hmm. I seek the truth. So I know the truth. So I can speak the truth. So I can teach the truth. The truth is the truth. And there's no substitute for it. And any substitute for the truth is a lie. Yes. It's as simple as that. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, We could go on and on and on, but I know we're coming up on that time, and um, I really want to thank you guys for having me back. It's uh, Once again, the time has just flown by. (laughs) It always does. It always does with you. Uh, Once we get quite certain. At this point, all you can think about is, uh, you know, hitting the bed and getting ready for <laughs> another day tomorrow. It's getting it's getting close to that time. Tell folks how they can get in touch with you, Bill. There's folks out there, they may want to buy your books. They may need deliverance. They may need counseling. How can they get in touch with Bill Bean? And again, I want to thank you guys so much for having me on and thank everybody out there for listening in. And for those of you out there who may be having problems, might be going through a bad time in your life, you may feel like you're cursed, you may may feel like you're under some sort of uh, demonic oppression, Um, whatever it may be, the good news is you have someone now that is talking to you right now that can help you, that can make a difference in your life. And this is not my power. This is the power of God working through me. So if you're having these types of problems, or if you'd like to buy a copy of my books, um, Dark Forces for Sale, uh, 10 Steps to Victory is a free download, visit BillBean.net and at www.BillBean.net, and you can, um, uh, you can email me directly from the site. And if you are having any of these types of problems, don't hesitate, because I do greatly care. I take all of this very personally because of my experiences in life. So mm-hmm. um, if you're having these problems, don't hesitate to contact me, www.building.net. And thank you all very much for listening in. Um, Wendy, Travis, thank you. God bless mm-hmm. you guys. God bless everybody out there. And we'll continue to pray for the people in uh, Houston and all the surrounding areas into Louisiana. Yes, absolutely. Together. And thank you so much for always uh, being on the show, Bill. Always a pleasure. Always walk away learning something and having had a good time. Absolutely. And I look forward to the next time with you guys. We will have you back on very soon. All right, guys. Have yes, a good will. night. You too, God sir. God bless you. You too. I, I haven't signaled Carla yet. Okay. <laughs> Send up the flare. <laughs> oh, okay, She's there. Oh, oh she's wait a minute. So good. You all in the listening audience can't hear Carly because she's our little voice that you know you can't hear. <laughs> she is real though, so I. <laughs> she is. At least we think she's. We don't know. 
Well, that's true. I've never met her in person. She may not be real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my imagination is just a fun place to dwell sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ooh, I'm having, I'm having You're being word calls. Out. Yes. yes. <laughs> I think it was Carly, <laughs> who may or may not be. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I believe that uh, next week we have uh, Kim Tarwater um, of a local uh, Kansas City local gypsy group. Um, uh, which I believe she'll be on next week and we will talk to her about her group and uh, multiple groups, apparently. And uh, and we'll just have a little fun with that and see where we go with it. And Travis, is there anyone the following week? Uh, not yet working on the Queen of the Paranormal uh, to okay. try to get try to get her that week. Okay, she has a, a hard to pronounce name, doesn't she? She does. That's why I call her the yeah. Queen of the Paranormal. Yeah, uh, she. I actually, when I met her, she was going by CC the Huntress. Uh, the Queen of the Paranormal was the the brand that she was <laughs> that she was using. Well, I guess um, it's better than Akasha, Queen of the Damned, eh? That's true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, all of our listeners um, out there that you know, join me in chat and and listen to the show and everything and and the future listeners I know a lot of people listen to the recording if they can't make it um, thank you for your attention uh, thanks for uh, liking the show and and talking to me in the chat and uh, you can follow our shows you can uh, uh, you can like our Facebook page of Mystic Moon Cafe Radio or you can uh, on Spreaker itself, you can follow the show. I forget now exactly how you do that, but I think it's fairly easy. Um, but, but thank you so much, and you can contact us at mysticmooncafe at gmail.com and uh, at mysticmoonc on uh, Twitter. Yes, and we would love to hear from you and uh, potential guests or potential topics for the show. Yes. Now, I, I believe on September 20th we have... Uh, uh, Cindy McKeon coming back on. She's a uh, Kansas City astrology tarot reader. Yes. And uh, we'll, we'll see what she's thinking about. Golly, she did up a chart and it was just so neat and so informative. And I, um, okay, I didn't understand all of it, but that's me. <laughs> I'm open minded and I listen to whoever wants to talk to me about these things. But uh, uh, yeah, she will be back on. We'll see. We'll see if. Her take on on Hurricane Harvey and and the poor people down south, and I hope y'all are safe. Yes, our thoughts mm -hmm. and prayers go out to all of you, Brian Trebig. If you're listening, um, I sure hope your boat's floating like you said it would be. <laughs> he lives on a houseboat, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But I believe that's just about all we've got for this evening. Um, we can get Carly to. To play our our ending and and uh, maybe one more song by by the Go Gomez fellow. Let's see which one was I going to do. Uh, Whiskey train for Travis. Yeah, Whiskey Thank train you. for Travis. Oh. I've, ridden, I've ridden that train before. <laughs> ah, you drove it. I know you. <laughs> I was the engineer. Yes, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sounds good. Yep. And I'm there on the caboose waving and, and wishing waving. everybody a happy day. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's windy. <laughs> Everyone have a great week. Good night.
Thank you for joining us tonight. You've been listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. Join us every Wednesday from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. On behalf of Wendy Schindler, this is Travis Short saying have a great rest of your week.